All right, welcome to video 20. Um, in this video, we're going to be talking about Desmond and Schullenberger's results on forced moves, and we're going to actually take a look at the the so the uh, scientific article where they uh, identify where, where where they back up the claims that Desmond makes more casually in uh, Evicted, and so when we do this, we're going to be hearkening back to uh, some of the stuff in. Uh, module six on uh, understanding the scientific method. And again, the goal here is to just to help you be a better consumer of scientific information and to use Desmond as an example of it. So I'm just going to be reiterating some of these themes. So in back in module six, uh, I ran through the story of Watson and Crick um, and their discovery of the structure of DNA. And I wanted to draw a few lessons from this. And here I'm just following the work of Ron Gere in his textbook, Understanding Scientific uh, Knowledge. Um, so what are, what are some of the lessons? Well, I think a big lesson to learn from the story of the discovery of the structure of hu human DNA is that science is a product of the interaction of humans with the physical world. Humans are petty and short-sighted, and the physical world is confusing. So, on the internet, frequently people will just come at you and say, well, it's science. And sometimes they're saying, well, it's science about something that is true, and sometimes it's false, and sometimes it's science, and sometimes it's not. But the important thing is that we need to get beyond just saying it's science. Um, and first of all, recognize that science is a product of human interaction with the physical world. And as a result, it's going to be shaped both by the physical world and human, inter and hu human interaction, human, human beings. So, uh, the other big lesson that I wanted to draw here is that scientists build models. Fundamentally, the whole predict, test, predict cycle is based around model building of one sort or another. Also, if I were to go more in depth about the scientific method, I would talk about the many routes of scientific communication. And another huge lesson from the Watson and Crick uh, story is that there's a lot of sexism in science, and that's why Rosalind Franklin got shut out of the history books. But uh, this isn't a full course on scientific methods, so we're not going to go into that. So two other points about science that in general I'd like to emphasize is the, the theory ladiness of observation and the underdetermination of theory by evidence. The theory ladenness of observation says that observations can never be described outside the context of a theory, one theory or another. So Rosalind Franklin's X-ray data was incredibly important for the discovery of uh, the structure of DNA. But if you or I just look at it, it just looks like a blurry photo of an X in a circle. In order to understand the data, you have to understand, you have to have a theory about how the machine works. Um, so you're already involved with theory. There's no pure observation. The other thing is the underdetermination of theory by evidence. And basically, this is just that um, you never have enough evidence, right? There, in one way or another, evidence is never enough to decide the theory. Um, you can always go back and try and revise the theory more to make it fit the evidence. Um, but at some point, that just seems like it's not a feasible project anymore. And you have to use really a, a, a judgment call about that, which may not seem as rigorous as people think of science as being. All right. The other thing is that scientists make maps. Uh, Watson and Crick made a physical model of human DNA. Um, in general, um, maps are not like the territory that they represent. They simplify. So a New York City subway map, that's not New York City, is it? 
Yes, I'm sorry. So a New York City subway map looks different than the New York City subway, and it loses information. It's not the same as it. All right. So whenever you have a scientific episode, some science is happening. Um, there's a real world, and there's the model of the real world. And again, I feel like a lot of mistakes come up because people forget that what they think of most of the time isn't the real world itself. It's just their representation of it. It's their own filter. It's their own understanding of it. But in any case, our goal is to test our understanding of it. Um, so you make predictions derived from this model, um, and then you try and... Um, interact with the world and see if that that data matches your prediction. So this is the chart that um, uh, Gere produces. This is the version of it that I did. Oh, this is a version of it just for the structure of DNA. We don't need to review all of this. So what I want to do now is actually just uh, look at the exercise on analyzing Desmond and Schulenberger and run through a little bit of what's going on there. Um, so the first thing I ask you to do is just identify the two major statistical claims, which you know are named right there in the abstract, um, and then identify these claims as a distribution, correlation, or causal relationship. So um, the, this is pretty easy, so I'll just lay it out there. Um, so more than one in eight Milwaukee renters experienced an eviction or other kind of forced move in the previous two years. That's a, that's a distribution. I, it says proportion on the uh, PowerPoint slide, but that's the same thing, right? Um, that is, you've got one quantifier there that's explaining the relationship between two properties. Um, the other uh, claim is that renters who experienced a forced move relocate to poorer and higher crime neighborhoods than those who move under less demanding circumstances. Now you've actually got two quantifiers. Um, there's the proportion of renters who experience a forced move, um, and then there's uh, the proportion of renters who relocate to poorer or higher crime neighborhoods. And you are saying that these two uh, are correlated. Um, so just to review, a distribution model represents how common a trait is in a population. Um, and a correlation model represents the relationship between two distributions. Um, and so... Uh, yeah, one example, for instance, in the book is that having children is correlated with being evicted. Um, so at bottom, a correlation is a relationship between two variables. So if you want to look at um, the, uh, the box diagram, the, the four box diagram that um, uh, Desmond and Schulenber Schulenberger do, coming from Geary, um, you see that you've got a real world and a model of the real world. Well, think about it. The real world is, is the city of Milwaukee and all the people who rent in it and all the landlords and all of that. Our model is our understanding of eviction, right? Um, and one of the things that Desmond notes is that when you talk to people and you talk about eviction they have a particular image in mind. Um, and it is the image that actually he uses in the book of, you know, the sheriff coming by and stacking your stuff on the curb. Um, but he wants to emphasize that that image of eviction is just a model. It, it, it's not the same as the real world. And if we change the way we represent the real world, we, in this case, we just change our definition of eviction, to use a broader idea, the notion of a forced move, we get a different picture of the world. So the real world is everyone who rents in Milwaukee. And of those, 1,086 people are interviewed as a part of the 
Milwaukee area renters survey. That's your data from the real world. That is the product of human interaction with the real world. Um, and our prediction, which turns out to agree with the data, is that um, more people will be seen to have be made forced moves once you use a broader definition of a forced move. And so again, I just want to emphasize that this is an example of the theory ladenness of observation. Um, we change our understanding on a theoretical level, our model of what an eviction is, and then we change our observations. All right. So Ron Geary has a elaborate mechanism for evaluating statistical hypotheses. And this semester, I'm simplifying it. So we're actually not, we don't need to run through this slide. And in particular, I'm not going to harp on the difference between the intended and the sample population this time around, um, even though it's important. Um, instead, I've got this revised thing that I want you to do. I just want you to identify the real world, the variables in the model, and their values the sample, the sampling method, and then do a correlation or distribution diagram. Um, and I'm just going to run through the last part here in this presentation. So, and you need to do this for both of the statistical claims, one of which is, is a distribution and one of which is a correlation. Okay. So this is how Geary represents distribution diagrams in his textbook. The top box represents the population as a whole. So if you're talking about a study like Desmond and Schulenberger, this would be all of the renters in Milwaukee. It's the real world, and it's all of the real world. The bottom box is our sample. Um, in this case, it was 1,086 individuals that were actually interviewed. So we're, we're not interacting with the whole real world. We're interacting with a sample of it. And uh, in the sample, the simple proportion is represented with um, language from sim symbols from probability theory here. So he says f of a. But really, that's just going to be, in our case, a, a quantifier 1 in 8, right? But the point is that when you make an inference from the sample to the population as a whole, uh, there's a margin of error. Uh, and as I mentioned before, that margin of error is based on the size of the sample. Um, but if you have a random population, a genuinely random sample, uh, for very large populations, uh, uh, 1,000 individuals is enough to get you a margin of error of plus or minus 3%. Um, and that's what's going on here. So. Um, when we do a simple correlation diagram for the forced move, uh, the percentage of people, or not correlation diagram, a simple distribution diagram, the bar graph, for forced moves uh, in uh, Milwaukee, we get um, this, this uh, lighter shaded area, which is, plus or, which is where the margin of error is, and that's plus or minus 3%. Um, and plus or minus 3% is a standard um, target uh, to have for political and sociological polling. So, um, for instance, if you watch the polls at, on 538 to, to follow the presidential election, all of those will probably have a, a margin of error of plus or minus 3%, and the original poll will probably have around 1,000 individuals in it. Um, and so that's, that's the target that Desmond is shooting for here. And so this is actually a simple diagram. Okay, you, if, you're dealing with a distri, uh, dis, if you're dealing with a correlation, you want to put two of these distribution diagrams next to each other, right? Um, and again, you've got uh, on top the real world, and on the bottom, the sample that you have taken from the real world. In this case, he is imagining a, um, uh, a standard example that's used in these sorts of things. You are pulling balls from an urn 
um, and those balls can be either red or not red, and they can be large or not large. This correlation here um, just shows that uh, the red ones are more likely to be large. And uh, we can ignore a lot of the complexity of this diagram, especially his uh, use of f of l, l slash r, that sort of probability language stuff. The point is simply that you've got four boxes that you have to deal with. There's the red, the red and not red gets you one axis and large and not large gets you the other axis. And so in order to see that two quantities are being compared here, you need um, to uh, to have all four of these boxes. You need, actually, you need data about them. And so one common form of actual statistical, uh, co common way people get misled by statistics is to m be, m is for someone to imply that there's a correlation here, but they really don't have all of the data you need to fill in all of these boxes. So in any case, um, You've got one side of this is a, is a distribution of 63%, the other side is 35%, and so that shows you that there's a correlation there. Um, and then when he maps that back up to the real world, he asks you to take into account the margin of error on both sides. That's another part of this that I'm not going to be doing this semester. Okay, so the last thing I want to show you is the correlation diagrams for um, the second claim in... Uh, Desmond and Schullenberger. Um, actually, we're going to break this up into two claims, right? So uh, one is that move uh, un undergoing a forced move correlates with um, moving to a, a neighborhood with a higher crime rate, and the other was that it m correlates with moving to a neighborhood with a higher poverty rate. So again, we're going to have two percentages, and I don't have the numbers here. Um, but uh, one is going to represent, so we'll just start with the diagram on the left. Um, forced move and no forced move is one dichotomy. Higher crime, not higher crime is the other. And so there are going to be two percentages. One is the percentage of people who, have a for, who uh, have undergo a forced move who move to a higher crime neighborhood. And the other is the uh, percentage of people who undergo, who, uh, don't have a forced move that move to a higher crime neighborhood. And again, uh, those two numbers are different, which indicates that there's a correlation. And the diagram on the right just shows you the exact same thing for the other half of this thesis, that there's a higher poverty rate in the new neighborhood. And so this is just to circle back to the actual um, ethical implications of this. Um, the point is that an eviction actually generally leads to two moves. There's, uh, this is what Desmond emphasizes. There's a hasty move that is forced um, where you go someplace where actually you don't want to be. And then after that, a second move where you wind up, uh, hopefully, in a better place. So again, what Desmond wants to emphasize is the consequences of eviction and how they resonate throughout a community. They disrupt the lives of individuals and they disrupt the, uh, the social fabric.